Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. I'm your host, Chris Smith, here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and the Lunchtime Discovery Series is a service brought to you by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. As always, it is good to be with you for another edition of our program because here at the Lunchtime Discovery Series, we get to meet interesting people doing really interesting work here in the state of North Carolina, sometimes beyond. Uh, and for today's program, we're going to stay a little bit close to home, but talk about something that is not so close to home, but is inching ever closer to our homes. And that was very confusing. Fortunately, we've got a great guest who I think will help us sort it out. We're going to get to that in just a second. I want to remind everybody that for this program, it is interactive. That's right. As we go through the program, make sure that you're in the chat. Even if you just drop in to say hi, let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to meet you in the chat if you're watching on YouTube or the comments on Facebook. But of course, after today's presentation, you'll have the chance to ask your questions. So type your thoughts and questions up into the chat as we go along, and then I will pose those to today's guest speaker after the presentation. So make sure to do that. Also make sure that you're following the Office of Environmental Education online. They've got a great website, eenorthcarolina.org and naturalsciences.org is the museum's website. At both places, you can find lots of opportunities, programs, and ways to connect with both places so that you stay in touch with everything that's happening, including future lectures just like this one. So uh, go ahead, bookmark those, check back often, for the latest updates. Now, let me bring on today's guest speaker to talk to us a little bit about some very threatening insects. We have Dr. Kelly Oden. Dr. Oden is an assistant professor and extension specialist at North Carolina State University's Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources. And Kelly joins me now. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for being here. If you're watching uh, virtually, I hope you're staying out of the heat today and come and learn to learn more about this very bad insect that I'm going to share with you. All right. So today I'm going to talk about the spotted lanternfly. Um, some of you may have heard about this before. It gained a lot of conversation. Um, and media attention back in the fall of this past year, simply because it was found very close to our state line in North Carolina. Now, this is an invasive that I am um, going to be telling you about. It is not yet found in North Carolina. So anytime we um, see a uh, or hear about an insect that's inching closer, we automatically have this feeling of dread a lot of times. So um, this is sometimes what it feels like when you see an invasive species inching ever closer to North Carolina, it's just gonna be bad news for our state. But one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is, is it really going to get here? Is it really going to be a problem? We've heard of some invasives before that are introduced to the US, but then they never make it to North Carolina. Well, in this case, um, a lot of people are saying it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. This is a map showing the current distribution of spotted lanternfly. And the alarming things are those two blue counties right there in Virginia, just north of the state line. So you can see why that could be a very alarming thing, especially when you see it didn't spread to get there. Um, someone probably accidentally moved some of these insect, insects. They can be very good hitchhikers. Um, and move them to a new area. It was found at a truck stop um, about 15 miles from our state line, um, and it will probably just grow. So yes, are we really going to get spotted lanternfly? Um, yes, probably sooner than we would have hoped after that recent discovery. And um, this is a closer map showing where it can be found in Virginia. You can see the yellow areas are where there's a light infestation or small infestations, but historically those infestations grow and they proceed to the orange and then the red stage. This is a map showing where we suspect of the potential distribution of spotted lanternfly in the US. So looking at North Carolina there, just looking at the hosts that are suitable, the environment that's suitable, um, you can see that a large part of North Carolina is going to be very suitable for spotted lanternfly. So of course we should all be very concerned and that's the exact reason why I'm gonna to talk to you today, what to look for, what to identify, 
and why we should be so concerned. What's so bad about this insect? So let's dive into the insect itself. Um, unfortunately, it's coming, so let's learn about its background a little more. What is the spotted lanternfly? This is what it looks like right here. A very beautiful insect, like a lot of our invasive species are. Gorgeous, stunning, um, spotted wings. You can see a little bit of the red underwings showing through. I'll show more pictures of that um, here in a second. But what is it anyway? Um, a lot of people see it and think it looks like a moth, um, but it's actually more closely related to uh, true bugs or cicadas, things like that. It is a sap-sucking plant hopper. It uses as piercing su sucking mouth parts to retrieve nutrients from trees. They don't eat the leaves. They don't bore into trees up like some of our other invasive pests. Um, this is a sucking insect. Um, they are native to Asia, to Northern China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and we did not know it to occur in the US until 2014 when it was found in Pennsylvania for the first time. And of course, you saw the previous map showing how it's only just spread from there. Now this insect has a lot of different looks and this has actually been a problematic thing when trying to share about this insect with the general public because you don't just show one thing, this is what it looks like. It actually goes through multiple different stages that all look very different from one another. This top left image right here, this is the egg mass, kind of this, this is a recently laid one. You can tell because it's shiny, it gets more dull um, after it's aged. But underneath this slimy mass are all the eggs, rows of eggs that the female has laid. This black and white spotted uh, nymph is the, the first uh, several instars are um, this coloration, this pattern. A lot of people think they look like ticks because of their leggy um, appearance, um, but they do hop around like ticks are unable to do. And then in their last stage um, of being a nymph, they get this red coloration pattern, which you can see in the top right. Um, so we see these uh, most, most of the year, spring, summer, and it's not until the fall until we see the um, adults emerge. The adults are right there on the bottom. Um, primarily, when they're at rest, you see them with their wings folded like that. That was the image that I just showed you. Um, but a lot of times you'll see uh, pamphlets, brochures, informational things with their wings spread. So it can be a little bit misleading because people look for those bright red wings or those yellow stripes on the abdomen. But when they're at rest, you actually can't see them. It's not until they fly or if they're dead and their wings are spread that you actually see those red underwings more. So I really try to share that picture of their wings at rest, folded tent-like over the abdomen, so people know what it looks like when it's you know just out there being an insect. So lots of different looks um, that go through various stages throughout the year. This is the life cycle. Um, looking at all of those, th those are the egg masses. Again, that same picture showing that shiny appearance of an egg mass that's just laid. Um, this is what it looks like after they've hatched. So the slimy covering is gone and you can see each individual egg and then a little hole in it where the nymph emerged. Now, when they first emerged, this bottom picture right here with all of the tiny um, pale looking insects emerging, um, they don't have a, much of a coloration to them, but they usually do within a day or so. So it's actually pretty hard to capture this phase, but you can see the many insects that are emerging for the, from, from those eggs. Now adults lay those in the late fall and they actually overwinter in this stage. Um, because adults lay them on different objects, um, I'll show pictures um, here in a second, um, you can, it's a stage that can easily be moved. So again, here's a covered egg mass and then right here are the rows once they hatch. And like I just mentioned, adults can lay them anywhere. So we primarily think of adults laying them on host material like the trees or other plants that the nymphs might emerge and attack, but that's just simply not the case with spotted lanternfly. This image on the right here, you can see there's an egg mass on bricks and all of these nymphs have emerged. Here is an egg mass on the top center where they're on deck or lumber material. Um, another one in the middle where they're on tires. So this has become a real big concern with RVs, cars, trucks that are moving inside and outside of the infested areas. If an egg mass is laid on something that's moved, you could easily move the egg mass to another area. And so it's happened, it's been, it's been spread, it, this insect has been spreading very quickly. And this is one of the reasons why. You can see top right that all of these egg masses at the bottom of this rusted barrel, they seem to really like rusted metal for some reason as well. And then the bottom right here where um, the egg mass is on this brick. 
Now, we suspect that the original introduction of spotted lanternfly was actually on infested brick or stone um, and then imported to Pennsylvania. Um, we think it was maybe a granite or brick shipment and the same way it got here is the same way it continues to move around. Now, this is the nymph stage. We start seeing them in late spring, early summer, and we expect them in North Carolina um, to be in the nymph stage throughout the summer. Again, those are the different, the four different stages where they're black with the white spots for most of it. And then that last stage, their biggest stage is when they get that red coloration on them. There's a close up of the two different stages side by side. You can see sometimes they group together, other times they might just be individual insects. But you'll see when we get to the adults, they do have mating swarms as adults. And then that's when they're really um, get together in their clusters and people really start to, to loathe them. And then you get to the adult stage. We typically expect adults to be late summer through the fall. Again, there's that picture with their wings folded over their abdomen. And then the other picture where their wings are held outright. So you can see that red underwing um, and then the yellow stripes on the abdomen. Again, another um, emphasis, not just showing the life cycle throughout the year. We expect them to have one life cycle a year. There's always the chance that that changes, especially when they get to warmer climates and some insects um, have more rapid reproduction um, in warmer areas. So to be determined for North Carolina, but based on Virginia, we would expect a one year life cycle. Um, but they also feed on different plants. So in their early instars, when they're in this black and white phase, we typically see them on more herbaceous plants. And then they slowly, as they grow, move to woody plants and then start attacking trees. And those are the issues that we're more familiar with their um, pestiferous activity. So what's the big deal with spotted lanternfly? Probably the biggest thing is they have a very wide host range. When they're nymphs, you can see their uh, host range right here, rose, grape, sumac, raspberry, cucumber, hops for you beer lovers, grape for you wine lovers. A tree of heaven you can see are on both, both lists. Um, this is actually a non-native uh, tree here in the US. It is native to the native range of spotted lanternfly, and it is the preferred host of spotted lanternfly. When we first started doing research on spotted lanternfly, we all thought that maybe it might require Tree of Heaven to, to reach adulthood, but that turns out it's not the case. Um, they have reduced fitness, but they can complete to maturity on other hosts as well. Um, as adults, they feed on a lot of different trees. So again, Tree of Heaven, the preferred host, but also a bunch of different other trees that we have and love here in North Carolina, walnut, birch, willow, maple, oak, pine used to be considered a host, but we've since taken that off the list, which is why you see the cross through um, right there. Um, one of the big concerns in North Carolina and other places that it's invaded is that it attacks great wine. Um, so this is a big concern for the viticulture and winemaking industry. We have a good number of them here in North Carolina. Um, and this insect, where should it be introduced, would cause great problems for that industry. Not only can they kill grapevine, um, but they also cause a huge reduction in crops. If they don't kill the vine outright, you can see up to a 90% reduction in crops. And then the grapes that are remaining have an altered sugar content. So they're not the same grapes that would be used to make the wine. Um, on top of that, um, if you've ever been to a wedding at a vineyard, this is another popular place for events. And when you have swarms of spotted lanternflies around, let's just say that's not on many brides' dream boards when they're picturing their big day. Um, so at the end of the day, they have a lot of different hosts that they will attack, and we have many of them here in North Carolina. So is this going to kill trees? Probably not. We know it's going to be an agricultural pest, primarily with grape, um, maybe with apples and other fruits, things like that but it's going to be a huge public nuisance pest as well. This isn't one of those invasive insects that are going to come in. And if someone has an ash tree in their yard, they know what the emerald ash borer is. No, everyone's going to know about spotted lanternfly. Um, they make huge messes because they're sap sucking insects. So they emit copious amounts of honeydew. This picture on the left right here um, is the cover of someone's truck bed. They parked under a tree that was covered um, or that was infested with spotted lanternfly. And their, the cover was covered in um, honeydew when they, got, when they came back out and left. Um, this middle picture shows honeydew and yeast colonies growing on that honeydew at the base of a tree. 
You can also see all of this black substance there. Um, that is all the sooty mold that is uh, traditionally grows on um, honeydew as well. And then the other annoying thing besides the mess, um, honeydew can also attract singing insects. So you can see this picture right here, there's a spotted lanternfly. Um, and then of course a singing insect that is brought um, to that honeydew. I parked under a tree one time that was infested with aphids and I got rained on by honeydew. And when I came back out to my car, these wasps were circling around my driver's side of my car and I had to crawl through the passenger side. So it can not just be annoying, but very embarrassing as well. <laughs> um, I already mentioned when they're, the adults are out, they have these huge mating clusters as well. This left picture shows spotted lanternfly on a tree in someone's backyard. You can see all the honeydew at the base of the tree, but also just the colony that's there. This greatly impacts people's quality of life when they're trying to sit out on their back patio, enjoy the day, their kids trying to play, but look, even the kids' car is covered in spotted lanternfly. Um, another very famous thing that happened was um, a swarm that congregated near the outside of Chipotle in downtown Philadelphia. Chipotle had to close their door and open a side entrance because this swarm of spotted lanternflies hovered there for days. Um, so they can be quite annoying. Um, I've also heard stories where people walk into Target and they're swarming on the mannequins. Um, you're walking down the street and they're you know, flying up your shirt, things like that. People are going to hate spotted lanternfly. Um, and there's products out there <laughs> that show it. Um, these picture or these uh, shirts and cups are available online. Um, people trying to kill the spotted lanternfly. You can see spotted lanternfly ninja, spotted lanternfly assassin. Um, they are pretty, admittedly, too bad we have to kill them all, like that one mug says. Um, and then this shirt on the right, which I'll mention later when we get to management, um, that is a sticky trap that would um, capture spotted lanternfly. And if you want a, um, a very seasonal, appropriate uh, shirt, go ahead and purchase that as well. Another big deal about this pest is it's federally regulated. There is a quarantine associated with this infect. Um, be going back to those egg masses, you see that tree on the right or on the left there covered in egg masses. This thing can be a hitchhiker, not just as an egg mass, but as a nymph or adult as well. So businesses operating in and that going into and out of the quarantine zone have to have a spotted lanternfly permit. This is what the permit looks like. Um, in order to get the permit, uh, business owners have to take or business um, people have to take a class. Um, in Virginia is through the Virginia Cooperative Extension Service. Um, you take this class, then you apply to the Department of Ag and get your permit. And then that permit basically trains you to inspect your vehicle for any signs of the insect itself or the egg masses on your vehicle or products that you're transporting. Um, it, it, the idea is that it reduces the spread, um, the hitchhiking that this insect can do. Um, but it's just one more complication that businesses would have to deal with if and when spotted lanternfly were introduced to North Carolina. So what can be done? Um, ahead of spotted lanternfly being introduced to North Carolina, one of the biggest things people are recommending is tree of heaven removal. Um, if you have a commodity that you're interested in protect, protecting grapes, your backyard, um, it's highly recommended to get the tree of heaven out there. Um, are out of there. They greatly prefer areas that have trees heaven, so removing them will likely reduce the probability that populations would be nearby. Now, the one thing about tree of heaven, you cut it down and you don't treat the stump, you're going to come back to a mess the next year. This tree will very easily and very quickly re-sprout. Um, usually people use triclip here. You can see on the right, this photo right here, um, all of that green uh, substance is where they treated um, the phloem and xylem layer to reduce um, or to kill the sump so that it wouldn't re sprout. So, if you decide to remove Tree of Heaven, you must absolutely must treat it with an herbicide so it does not sprout back. Um, another thing that we're doing, this is what I'll spend a little bit of time on because this is what we're currently doing in North Carolina and what I've been a part of, is awareness to prevent this insect from getting to North Carolina in the first place. Um, so this is something we've been doing for a while because other invasive insects, the Asian longhorn beetle, the emerald ash borer, the spongy moth, um, the red bay ambrosia beetle, they can all be transported in or on firewood. So the Don't Move Firewood campaign is something that's been going on for over a decade now, trying to increase awareness 
that if you move firewood around, you could accidentally be moving invasive pests around as well. And the same goes for spotted lanternfly. Um, by the way, this map right here, all of those purple dots in North Carolina are uh, areas where spotted lanternfly has been found, but has not yet established in North Carolina. Um, so you can see one, two, three, four, nine different spots where they have found an adult. Um, they've done a lot of follow-up surveys. Um, they look, they do um, host surveys. They backtrack to see how that insect could have gotten there. Um, so I'm just pointing that out because spotted lanternfly can clearly get to North Carolina. We just have been lucky where it hasn't uh, caused a reproducing uh, population in our environment just yet. Um, so very important that we try to do our best to keep it out as much as we can. So back to the Don't Move Firewood campaign, they're starting to include spotted lanternfly messaging as well. Um, it is not a wood boring insect, we already mentioned that, um, but because their egg masses can be on firewood or on a tree, and then that tree is cut down and cut up into firewood and can then be moved around, it can easily be moved around. And that's the exact same way that spongy moth, the insect previously known as gypsy moth has been moved around as well because they lay egg masses that can easily be moved from place to place. But not only do we want it to not be introduced to the North Carolina in the first place, we know that it's just a matter of time. We're trying to reduce those incidences, um, but we also want people to know what they look like so that they can report them quickly. If they report them to us quickly, then we have a much greater chance of actually getting rid of the population, hopefully eradicating it before it became a bigger problem. So to combat this, we started a program called Poolside Pests last year. And this is to increase awareness for the spotted lanternfly and the Asian longhorn beetle, which I won't mention today. Um, our focus is on spotted lanternfly, but they are two invasive insects that are both found in neighboring states. Of course, spotted lanternfly in Virginia, and then Asian longhorn beetle, which is, uh, has a, a, a quarantine zone near Charleston, South Carolina. So this is what our landing page of our website looks like. You can go right to the page and click to report a site in. Um, but why poolside? That's something that people always ask about. Um, the, both of these insects are attracted to water. There's a spotted lanternfly in a pool, it's also one of the traps that are used in gardens or other areas where people um, have an infestation. They're trying to do a DIY a home remedy for the populations. This is literally just a pan of soapy water set out and the spotted lanternflies dive right in. And if you put soap in it, it basically reduces the surface tension so that they can no longer get out. The soap kills them, breaks down their waxy cuticle on their exoskeleton, and it's a very effective trap. Um, but we've seen pictures where spotted lanternflies are in pool filters, um, in dog water bowls, in someone's coffee cup. They're trying to enjoy a drink on their back porch and spotted lanternfly just goes right for it. Um, Asian longhorn beetle does the same thing. When Asian longhorn beetle was first detected just outside of Charleston um, and they started talking to homeowners in the area, showing them pictures of the insect, people were like, wow, that insect has been hanging out of the pool for several years. So it was attracted to the pool, but no one knew to report it. So our goal with this program is that people know to report it and can report it so that we can respond much more quickly than several months or even in the case of Asian longhorn beetle, seven years later after its introduction. So our goal is to you know, kind of be more attractive with this poolside pest um, mentioned, maybe that kind of be our hook, but the reality is both of these insects can really be found anywhere in the natural environment. So we're hoping our reach goes beyond those of just pool owners. So what are we doing? We're training um, internal people. This is a collaborative effort between uh, me here at NC State, um, our extension forestry team, um, and also with um, uh, the North Carolina Forest Service and the NCDA and CS pests or uh, plant industry division. So we do internal trainings to extension agents, uh, forest health professionals, forest service, um, things like that. We also do outreach events to the general public. We did two last year. We've already done three this year. We primarily target um, home shows where people are there. To, you know, sometimes they're, they're interested in pools. Sometimes they're just, you know, there to learn about different um, outdoor products, things like that. And then we're just out there um, giving away informational materials. We usually have 
displays available so that they, they can see these insects in person. Um, we also try to hit the media pretty hard. Um, last year, we had three press releases, three TV interviews, and 14 written news pieces that took off from those um, press releases. Um, I just had, we're just gearing up for the season this year. So schools are just now starting to open about, um, a, about a month ago or so. Um, I actually had my first, um, interview this morning with the NNO. Um, so look for that later today or tomorrow for that article coming in. Um, we also try to hit social media pretty hard with target, targeted, um, uh, sponsored ads. We've had three blogs last year. Um, we also had eight Facebook posts reaching 41,000 people and then nine tweet tweets reaching 15,000 people. This year we had one um, targeted post that would reach nearly 50,000 people. And that just ran for three days during Memorial Day weekend. So we're hoping that we're getting reaching these people during a timely um, season when they're out at pools, when they're outside even more, um, when it's not as hot as it is today, so that people will see these insects. And then if they actually see them themselves, it's fresh in their minds. So this is just an example of one of the media piece, pieces that came out, um, just spreading awareness for this program and for these two pests. Um, another thing that we've done, the pool side aspect, is we've partnered with pool companies. Um, we partnered with 42 pool companies last year um, and one pool, pool care company. Um, we basically go out and distribute these magnets. You can see this is what the magnet looks like right here. Um, and we give them to these pool companies. Then if someone comes in, they buy um, products for their pools, um, you know, chemical, things like that. As they check out, that company, that vendor will drop this magnet. It's just the size of a business card. We'll drop that magnet in their bag so when they get home, Hopefully they'll put it on their fridge and you know kind of become more familiar with the insect. And we also created 1,000 mailers um, when we partnered with the pool care company, and they put one of these mailers in each of their bills for the month of I believe it was May or June last year. So everyone with the pool got that in their monthly bill. Um, so bad news, you owe money, and more bad news, the insects are coming. But hey, maybe you can help us look for them, right? <laughs> and the reason why this is so important. Um, is because the more outreach that we do, we know that it actually works. Um, this has been studied with the Don't Move Firewood campaign with um, consistent outreach, um, the awareness for uh, firewood spreading invasive um, insects jumps from 38% to 96%. So we're hoping the same occurs with our pool side pests. Um, we haven't had as many in-person interviews, but, or not interviews, but events. Um, coming out of COVID, but we're hoping that as we start doing that, that the, this outreach program reaches more and more people. So again, why is it so important? Well, eradication efforts, which that would be the goal for either one of these insects, um, are much more effective when we know about the population early. I already mentioned the Asian longhorn beetle was there for seven years before it was reported. Um, if we know about it in the first year or two, that would be much fewer trees that were cut down as a result of its infestation. And then with spotted lanternfly, these insects, not only do they spread very quickly, but they reproduce very quickly. So if we can get ahead of the game, um, our best bets of actually doing that are learning about an infestation very quickly. So what are being, what's being done for it? Um, one of the things that are being done are traps. This is a sticky band trap. You saw it on one of the shirts that I showed earlier. You can see uh, basically because the insects crawl up and down the tree, if you put a sticky band around the tree, very similar um, to canker worm, if you're familiar with fall or spring canker worm banding, there as they go up the tree, they just get stuck. Now, these can, spotted lanternflies can be very abundant. So it's important if you utilize this method um, that you regularly monitor that sticky band. Otherwise, so many of these spotted lanternfly will get stuck on the band that the eventually it'll just be, they'll just walk over the backs of their buddies and you know, not get stuck to the band. Another thing that is used are circle traps. So you can see it on the trunk of this tree here. Um, it's basically this mesh structure on um, which as the spotted lanternfly migrates up the trunk, they basically get funneled into this bag at the top of the trap. And then they don't know how to get out because insects are very drawn you know, to going upward and towards light. So they get stuck in there and then they die. Um, the thing about either one of these traps is that they're both best used for detection. Um, it won't really take down or eliminate a population. And 
you can see with both of these, the way they work, they only detect or kill insects on the host tree on which these traps are placed. So they are used for detection. Um, driving around this uh, summer in North Carolina, you might come across circle traps. There are many placed at uh, rest areas across the state, um, state parks. There were also targeting uh, stone um, areas that receive stone shipments, things like that. Um, to try to detect spotted lantern fly. Um, there are chemicals available as well. Um, there are contact insecticides. Um, many of them work very quickly for knockdown. Um, as far as longevity, bifenthrin seems to be the most effective. Um, however, again, this is really best when there's an infestation already occurring. Um, as far as systemics, dinotefuron has been the go-to insecticide for treatment um, of trees or, and other plants to protect them from um, spotted lanternfly infestations. But we don't have an infestation yet, right? Um, our goal is to keep it that way. So what's being done in areas where spotted lanternfly already occurs and what we plan to do here in North Carolina, this would be done under the North Carolina Department of Agriculture Plant Industry Division, and they're ready to go and respond should spotted lanternfly be found. But the plan would be to utilize trap trees. And basically what this means is wherever there's an infestation, they'll go to that area. And if there's, they will scout for all the trees in the area, especially for tree of heaven. And if a tree is under six inches diameter at breast height or ZDH, then that tree is killed with an herbicide. So they just want it gone. They don't want there to be a host tree anymore. Um, and that would be conducted April through October um, just because of how the chemicals are affected. Now, if a tree is over six inches dBH, then they use those trees as trap trees. And then they would treat those trees with dinotefuron. Dinotefuron is a systemic insecticide. So once the insects are drawn to these large trees, because they're the only ones left, and then they feed on the tree, then they'll consume the insecticide and then die. So that's the goal behind using this trap tree method, um, basically using their own um, host source against them to hopefully snuff out any populations. Um, NCDA is also doing many surveys. Um, they're focusing on high-risk areas, um, state parks, um, rest areas, rail yards, hardscape businesses, again, going back to those um, stones and bricks and things like that, metropolitan areas, tourist hotspots, things like that. Um, how do we search though? Um, I already mentioned the circle traps. There's a circle trap placed um, at a lot of rest stops. If you take the time to look, you might see one. Um, and placed sporadically across the state as well. But another very cool thing that NC, NCDA now has is a detector dog team. So North Carolina has two dogs. Um, this is one right here. Um, this is the one, this is PETA. She's in the eastern part of the state and there's another dog uh, stationed in the western part of the state. And these dogs are trained to sniff out spotted lanternfly. And they are very good at it. They're much more effective, more, much more effective than adults are or than people are, because our efficacy is really just about 40%. You saw how, um, how those spotted lanternfly egg masses are really hard to see, especially on the bark of trees. If you get a dog in there to sniff it out, then that's a really good way to detect some of those infestations that we may not have seen. So anytime that there's a report, um, someone says they see spotted lanternfly, um, this uh, team goes out there, brings their detector dogs with them, and tries to see if there is actually an infestation of spotted lanternfly nearby. Um, they're also bringing these dogs to rest areas, those hot spots that I just mentioned, um, trying to sniff them out um, just in case those uh, traps don't work. At the end of the day, we want people to see it, if they see it, to report it, right? Well, how do you report it? Um, one of the ways is by uh, sending an email to badbug at ncagr.gov. This actually goes to several people within the Department of Ag that could respond to these um, new finds. Or you can go to poolsidepest.com, which is our website for that outreach program, um, and click on the report here button that I showed you previously. So here's my little joke. Here's a phone call, someone who cares, we care, um, and you should care too. So make sure you get this information in the right hands but we can actually respond quickly. With the spotted lanternfly and Asian longhorn beetle, there would most likely be a next day response 
because both of these are such bad insects and could cause major um, damage to our um, natural ecosystems and just to our general livelihoods here, here in North Carolina. Um, with that, I'll leave you with some social media that you can follow, um, our Twitter and our Facebook, so you can keep up with not just spotted lanternfly, but, but other insect activities going on. Um, and there's a photo of my daughter. She is now almost eight. She does not let me dress her anymore, but back when she did, I put her in a don't move firewood. It makes me cry onesie. Um, and she was all mascot for Arbor Day. So I'm um, keeping that in mind. Make sure you spread the word. Um, and with that, I will take any questions. Amazing. Kelly, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody, great big round of applause for Dr. Kelly Oden. Uh, very, very exciting stuff. Well, I, I okay, exciting is not the right word for it, I guess. Uh, it's a very interesting presentation, a lot to learn about spotted lantern fly. Uh, and I think we got a lot of folks here who are going to be keeping an eye out for it for sure. I hope so. It's one that the more eyes looking for it, the better, you know, people like me can't be everywhere at once. And we rely on reports to know if it's here in North Carolina. You know, I, as folks are uh, getting some of their questions typed up into the chat now, I'm curious, like, what are the odds, maybe this is depressing, what are the odds that it's here established and we just haven't got to it yet? With spotted lanternfly, I would say the odds are less than a lot of our other insects, um, simply because they're not quiet, they're not shy, they have these huge swarms, people will notice this insect. So I would suspect that um, if it's found in North Carolina, um, unless it's in a remote area, we would probably, mm -hmm. we would probably hear about it pretty quickly. Um, that differs from a lot of other invasive insects that I work on, like emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, those are very cryptic insects. They're living inside a tree, they don't create these huge swarms, so they're a little bit harder to detect. And one of the main reasons, like I mentioned, that Asian longhorn beetle was there for many years before anyone ever saw it or knew to report it. Well, that's, that's good to know, <laughs> at least for the, the spotted lanternfly. At least for All that right. one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see. Let's, uh, let's get some questions from the chat. The first one I've got here for you that your presentation didn't already answer at least, uh, are there tips for differentiating between the egg masses and lichen? Ooh, that would be, um, there's actually, there's a lot of things that look like the egg masses. Probably the most similar one would be the spongy moth egg mass. Um, but my recommendation is to treat them the same way. Um, uh, lichen are more flat um, in appearance. What most people, um, describe the egg masses of spotted lanternfly looking like is if it's someone smeared silly putty on the side of a tree. Um, at the end of the day, if you're, if you're in doubt, one of the things that people recommend doing is using a card, maybe like a credit card, maybe not one you want to use, but a credit card like card and actually scraping that egg mass off, making sure you're squishing the eggs as you do it. That's one of the things that they're really promoting in the infested areas. And they actually pass out cards with which to do it. They have information on those cards about the spotted lanternfly. Um, and they try to promote the, the overwintering scouting for those egg masses and then ultimately removal and destroying them. Removing and destroying. Uh, Michael wants to know if you've observed any predators of these insects. Yes, there are uh, several predators. Uh, we know birds will feed on them. Apparently they don't taste very well. Um, there are some biological control agents as well. Um, there's investigations into pathogens that might help us control them as well. But all of those are uh, pretty new uh, research-wise because it's such a new insect. So, uh, so not a lot of hope for any of our like native predators to be a if, control on spotted lantern fly. If they're, I'll say this way, if they're reducing the populations, they're not reducing them enough because this thing is still spreading. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Jerry was asking if Tree of Heaven could be used to attract lantern fly. Oh, yes. Trap yeah, trees. Yeah, the trap uh, but then, yeah. 
do you then leave the big tree and just use it as a trap tree year over year? Or do you then get rid of it like the smaller trees? That's a good question. I'm not sure what the program plan um, would be, but if it's, um, if the population of spider lanternfly is completely removed using it, I would just recommend you know, whichever the landowner prefers. Um, it is an invasive tree in and of itself. So my recommendation would, would be to kill it. <laughs> Take it out. Yes, <laughs> get rid of all the invasives. And that's another thing that's, you know, been discussed is um, this thing really likes Tree of Heaven, right? And um, Tree of Heaven is found statewide. It's very common in disturbed areas, especially along roadways. Um, so it will have plenty of host material aside from all of those native hosts that were off, are also susceptible. Excellent stuff. All right, let's see. Uh, Amanda with State Park, with uh, NC State Parks at South Mountains wants to know if they've got a special event, who do they contact to get a display with information on spotted lanternfly? So you can either contact me um, and maybe I could put my um, email back up on the slide at the end, or I could, I'll just say my email, klfelder, F-E-L-D-E-R at ncsu.edu. Shoot me an email. You could also get up with your local extension agent um, or the North Carolina Department of Ag Plan Industry Division. Although I work really closely with them, um, if and usually we collaborate together to make sure educational materials get to where they need to go. Good stuff. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get the word out. Yes, please do. I've got boxes of things to give away at events like that. So state parks, um, if you're hosting something, please let me know what you're interested in and I can get some materials to you. Excellent stuff. Uh, let's see, here's a good one from Glenn. Is there a pheromone lure or trap like those that exist for Japanese beetles? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think there is yet. The circle traps are not baited. Um, and those soapy water traps um, don't use a pheromone. Um, I don't know where they are in the development stage of the pheromone. I know there's definitely interest. I, there usually is with invasive like that. Um, but I, there is, they don't use it for trapping. I'll put it that way. I'm not, I'm not sure about other uses. All right. Uh, and now Ruth writes uh, with a little bit of concern that if we refer to spotted lanternfly as poolside pests, those of us who don't have pools won't be so concerned about it. Yeah. Yeah. We've experienced that a little bit too. And we're trying to, you know, we have messaging that doesn't include the poolside pest aspect as well. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a very valid concern. And one we've seen, you know, especially interacting with people at events, uh, people come by and it's like, oh, I don't have a pool. And we're like, you don't need a pool. You can still do this. So that is a barrier um, that we didn't really think of when we first uh, started branding it. But because, you know, mm -hmm. we're targeting that the pool industry and pool owners, as well as everyone, we have a little bit of both. Yeah, and it seems like if they, if they, you said they love water so much, so that would be a good, maybe early detection method. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, that was one of the things we joked about early on is like, if you have a pool, you have it, you have an insect trap, so. <laughs> right, <laughs> or a cup of coffee on your balcony. Exactly, <laughs> we would have thought. <laughs> Either way. Okay, uh, let's see, is there an iNaturalist project for spotted lanternfly? Ooh. I do not think there is a project, um, not, not that I'm aware of. I will say I know the plant industry division regularly checks iNaturalists for reports of spotted lanternfly in North Carolina. And the last I heard, there were two reports last year and they follow up on them. So they try to contact um, the user, you know, especially if the geography is obscured a little bit and, and try to get in touch with them and then bring the detector dogs to do that following up. And they basically treat it the same as they would if someone emailed in a report. Okay. And Amanda also asked, if a sighting is documented on EDD maps, does it still need to be reported to NCAG? Ooh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I would say yes. I would, you know, because EdMaps is, 
Um, one of those things where a lot of people report invasive, but it's not a complete picture of what we know. Um, so it's often not a source of action, right? Um, so I would say, yes, if you are in North Carolina and you see spotted lanternfly, don't just go report it on EdMaps. Uh, make sure it's reported to the Department of Ag. Um, you know, especially if they are checking that. Um, I haven't had a specific conversation with them. If they are, like, like I know they are with iNaturalist. Um, but if they are, there's a chance that it, there's lag time, right? Like they check it once a month or something like that. So I would greatly encourage people to contact the Department of Ag directly. There you go. Uh, there's also a little bit of love for the detector dogs in the chat. So I'm imagining that often are the dogs out and about looking for lanternflies in North Carolina. They're out and about a lot. Um, there is some, there is someone assigned to each dog that is the dog's handler. Um, and not only are they going out and just checking random parks, um, responding to reports, but they also have to stay up to date on their training. So um, they have these, you know, small containers that have the egg mass or spotted lantern fly in it. And so they're always practicing. Um, I teach forest entomology here at NC State, and I had the dog, um, the eastern one, Kita, come out for one of our labs and do a demo. And it's amazing how fast she was able to detect the spotted lantern fly. Um, I thought it was one of those things where like you do the demo and maybe the last 10 minutes. No, she found it in like 20 seconds. Um, so they're oh, wow. very, very, yeah, they're very good at it. Um, talking to the handler, her name is Jackie uh, Ferdue. Um, she said she can't remember the last time the dog wasn't a, that didn't detect the spotted lanternfly. So they're very effective and she's out very, very often. <laughs> We've got, uh, got some bark rangers on the job. Yes. <laughs> and what a job, uh, right? To, to have what a, a job. detector dog. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, let's see. I'm looking for more here. You know, I'm curious as well. Uh, what's the communication and collaboration like between like North Carolina and Virginia and Pennsylvania when it comes to tracking and eradicating? Like, how does information share happen and things like that? Um, it happens a lot of different ways. There is a central spotted lanternfly website. It's Stop SLF. Um, so that's where the central information, where the most updated maps are always posted, things like that. But on top of that, there's a lot of behind the scenes um, because research is always happening. Everyone wants to be most, you know, most up to date with it. Um, there's a bi-weekly call um, hosted by the USDA where people working in and on spotted lanternfly join the call. They give their updates, they give their recent publications. Um, there's also a lot of uh, town hall events. There was one yesterday, for example, that was you know, four or five hours long. There's gonna be a webinar tomorrow. Um, and they just, they have a lot of summits. You know, this is a big pest that requires a lot of money to control it. Um, so there's a lot of collaboration. It's one of those things that's actually very amazing to see not just different states working together, but different levels of organizations, whether it be the federal government, state government, universities, extension, all of the above. Excellent, excellent to hear. It sounds like you're gonna have a few people getting in touch with you, school teachers, other state uh, state officials to- uh, do. <laughs> we're, we're, this is We're gonna make it happen. We're gonna get ahead of Spotted Lanternfly we're going to say not in North Carolina. That's right. The black stops here. <laughs> the, it stops right here. We've got dogs on it and we've got people on it. Uh, Dr. Odin, thank you so much for being on the program today. Thank you for having me. Excellent Any chance stuff. I can to talk about insects. <laughs> uh, and if you, uh, I'm going to wrap up. Kelly, if you can share that last slide that had the contact information. And I think I it had a picture that. of a lantern fly on it too, so that everybody gets that search image burned into their brain. Although there's one on the screen behind you as well, isn't there? There is, yes. There it is. That way uh, folks can take note of what to do if they're out and about in North Carolina and come across one of these insects and get a positive ID on it. Yeah, so it's a picture of my daughter, not a lantern fly. 
that's my email. I said it's klfelder at ncsu.edu. That will go to the exact same email. You can also use kelly underscore Oten at ncsu.edu. Both of those will get to me. Excellent stuff. Folks, we'll be back here again next Wednesday at noon with another edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. We'll be talking about North Carolina's Artificial Reef Program. So don't miss out right here at the museum's YouTube channel, noon Eastern next Wednesday. Go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click the bell to get notified when we go live. That way you can get the notification to come and join us every single week. Until next time, everybody, take care, stay safe, keep an eye out for spotted lanternflies that are lurking around out there somewhere, waiting to get in, and uh, do your part to keep your community safe. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody. <laughs>